Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you happen to be. And thank you very much for joining Taste the Spirit of Japan 2021. Uh, we are here in Tokyo. My name is Christopher Pellegrini, and with me is Chef Mark Matsumoto. And we are very excited that you have joined us today to learn all about Japan's best kept secret, namely Shoju and Awamori. And uh, we are able to do this today thanks to the support of the Japan Sake and Shoju Makers Association. And they will be providing us with some gifts that we'll talk about later for people who uh, fill out the questionnaire at the end of today's session. But before we get to that point, we've got a lot in store for you. Um, for those of you who received the kit, you should have your bottle, you should have some snacks, you should have some mixing ingredients and also some literature. Uh, and we are going to be using all of those step-by-step. Step. First, we have a distillery tour, care of Stephen Lyman. After that, we're going to talk about the differences between shochu, awamori, and other drinks, traditions from around the world. And that will lead us into a pairing that Mark is going to lead us through. We're gonna match these five drinks with some of the snacks that you receive. And finally, we're going to get a professional mix, mixology lesson from Mr. Sato, who is an elite bartender here in Japan. So without further ado, um, ah, let me just remind you that if you have any questions at all, any comments, then please use the chat function. And we will be monitoring that throughout the session and we'll bring in questions whenever, whenever it's convenient. Yep. Guess. So um, I don't know, anything we should, else we need to say before we get started? I think we should jump into this. Okay, I'm looking start. forward to this. <laughs> yep. so, um, Steven, are you out there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well down here in Fukuoka. You gentlemen up in Tokyo, nice to see you, as nice always. Nice to see you. And I guess we'll jump right in with an introduction to Shochu and Awamori, a little bit of the history and that sort of thing. And then we'll, we'll, we've got a recorded video of a, a tour, uh, well, video tour of a distillery in Oita Prefecture, which is just to the east of here, famous for making barley shochu, Fuji distillery. Uh, but why don't I start with uh, sharing my screen and talk folks through a little bit of... Um, Shochu and Awamori. Uh, I will need uh, screen sharing enabled, please. We'll get that to you. Uh, so Stephen's gonna, Stephen, as many of you will know, is the author of the, the complete guide to Japanese drinks and a Shochu and Awamori pro based here in Japan. And so he's got all of the experience necessary to authoritatively walk you through this process, perhaps more than anybody else. Uh, that has that has you know not worked at Fuji Shuzo themselves. So Stephen, you do you have the? Uh, I do not yet have uh, screen sharing capabilities. So if the host can please uh, enable screen sharing, I can start my presentation. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, here we go. Great. Well, thank you. Welcome to Taste the Spirit of Japan 2021, uh, organized by the Sake and Shochu Makers Association and the National Tax Office. Uh, the talk today we called Japan's Best Kept Secret, uh, which is Honkaku Shochu and uh, Ryukyu Awomori. Uh, next slide, please. So really, I want to give you a brief uh, history of Japanese alcohol. And we will start actually in the, in the prehistory of Japan uh, in Awomori Prefecture in far north Japan. It's believed the first alcohol was uh, made by indigenous people, the Jomon people, around 3000 BCE, so about 5000 years ago. Uh, they were simply making a fruit wine. And it was about 3000 years ago that rice cultivation began in Japan, uh, imported from uh, mainland Asia. So about 2000 years after that fruit wine was being made. Uh, and this very quickly led to, uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, sorry, um, this, uh, that rice growing uh, led to a very, very rough uh, 
sake fermentation methods, but it was really in 550 AD, so about 1500 years ago, that Chinese fermentation methods were introduced uh, from the mainland, and this really changed how alcohol was produced in Japan. Next slide, please. Uh, and this, this was really uh, through koji being introduced through these uh, Chinese yeast balls is what we typically refer to them. They're actually called chu. Uh, next slide, please. However, in these, in these, in these chu, the, uh, there have been uh, microbiologists who have evaluated these, and there are dozens of organisms all living together in these, in these yeast balls. There's molds, there's yeast, there's bacteria, uh, and all of these are used uh, in Chinese fermentation. Next slide, please. And however, in sake, what the Japanese ended up doing for sake production uh, is they isolated three of these organisms in traditional sake. One is Aspergillus mold, one is Saccharomyces yeast, and one is uh, Lactobacillus bacteria. Next slide, please. The mold, Aspergillus orizae, which is traditionally used for sake, it breaks, breaks starches into sugars. So it's replacing the process of malting uh, as we do in the West. Uh, then Saccharomyces cerevisiae is actually yeast. This is what converts sugars, sugars to alcohol. This is essentially the yeast that's used to make all alcohol around the world, or at least this, uh, uh, this general kind. And then Lactobacillus, that bacteria, uh, for sake, because yellow or because Aspergillus orizae or yellow koji, which we'll talk about in a minute, is, uh, does not create an acidic fermentation. The Lactobacillus bacteria actually creates a natural lactic acid uh, fermentation in order to fight off other organisms that might want to join the party. Next slide, please. So that Aspergillus mold is koji. This is uh, this is the uh, next slide. This is the uh, next slide, please. This is really the national mold of Japan. Japan takes its koji so seriously that it's designated it as the national mold. Uh, as we mentioned, this is made. This is used to make sake, but it's also used in almost all traditional Japanese fermentations. It's used to make miso, mirin, soy sauce. You can use for pickling. Of course, it's used for uh, shochu and awamori as well. Uh, it can actually be used as a meat tenderizer and even as a di digestive aid. Uh, so it's a really uh, magic mold. Uh, next slide, please. So how does koji work? Next slide. So koji is grown on steamed rice or another starch base and creates amylase and protease, among other things. The amylase breaks down complex carbohydrates or starches, uh, which is what converts them to sugars. And then the protease actually breaks down proteins, which is how it can be used as a meat tenderizer. Next slide, please. Now, this uh, koji process was actually uh, perfected by Buddhist monks during the Nara period in the 700s AD. Uh, this is really when modern sake methods were developed. Uh, this is when rice polishing was developed. Obviously, the koji making that lac lactic acid fermentation, making the yeast starter or the shubo, for those of you who are familiar with sake production, and uh, then making the main mash, the, the main fermentation, and then, of course, pressing the sake to have clarified sake. Uh, okay, and then... So that's Japanese sake, which is rice, water, yeast, and koji. Uh, and the production is through fermentation and pressing the sake to, to, to uh, extract the clear sake. The sake is made nationwide in Japan, and other names for it are Nihonshu and Seishu. Seishu is the, is the actual official name. Uh, Nihonshu simply means Japanese alcohol. Next slide, please. Now... That was 500, 550 AD that the, uh, that the koji arrived, that technology arrived. And then the next big breakthrough in Japanese alcohol production is in the 1400s. Uh, next slide, please. And for this, we need to actually go to the UQ kingdom. This is, uh, this is an independent country for much of, it, his, much of its history. Uh, next slide, please. And the UQ Kingdom, which is centered in Naha, you can see on the map on the left, this is a central trading port for uh, much of Asia. This, uh, the, the UQ Kingdom traded all throughout Asia, up into China, into Korea, Japan, as well as Southeast Asia. And they were notorious drinkers. They would go to all the different ports and buy up as much alcohol as they could find. Next slide, please. Uh, however, through all that trading, they actually ended up bringing distillation technology or the traditional pot still uh, into uh, the UQ. It's not exactly clear where it came from, whether it was with trade with China or with trade with Korea, with trade with 
uh, Southeast Asia, uh, for example, Thailand, or Siam at the time, but uh, we do know that distillation technology arrived in UQ probably a little bit before it arrived in Japan. Next slide, please. Now, what's unique about the spirit made in Okinawa is a couple things. One is it's made with Aspergillus awamori, which is actually black koji. So as I mentioned earlier, Aspergillus ortize is what's used to make sake, that's yellow koji. Now, black koji creates a lot of acidity naturally in the fermentation, so you don't need the bacteria to do that job. Uh, and then the other thing is that awamori is typically made with 100% koji, uh, which is very unique. Next slide, please. And this is really how awamori was, was, uh, was born, was through this distillation arriving in, uh, in the Ryukyu Kingdom, which is modern day Okinawa. Next slide, please. So for Ryukyu awamori, it's rice, water, yeast, and koji. You can only use rice, and you have to use black koji. Those are rules. Uh, it's fermented, and then it's pot distilled. Uh, so a single pot distillation, which is often used in whiskey production in the West. Uh, and then as far as aging, some of it is essentially it's bottled young and some of it is long aged, uh, which is known as kusu awamori. And more than 99% of awamori is still made in Okinawa, although it is legal to make it in other parts of uh, Japan and around the world. Next slide, please. So that's awamori. That's the kanji, if anybody's curious. Next slide, please. So fishermen traded goods, right? This is really how a lot of the trade was happening, sort of illicit, uh, I guess, gray market or black market trade back in the day, rather than official delegations going back and forth, the distance between the UQ and Japan, Southern Japan or the UQ, uh, sorry, and, uh, and then Northern Kyushu and Korea are actually quite close. And so fishermen would often trade goods and even distillation technology, which is how we believe that uh, the, the pot still arrived in Japan, whether it came up through the UQ or, or down through Korea. Uh, one of those routes seems most likely. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we have distillation arrived in Japan, probably in the 1400s, uh, at least in Ryukyu, and, and, and definitely by the early 1500s uh, in Japan, proper down in Kyushu in southern Japan, where I'm based. Uh, although probably these, these may have been almost simultaneous, the, the difference being that in Okinawa, uh, the distilled alcohols were, were very quickly adopted by the royal family as something uh, desirable, while the peasants, the uh, fishermen and the farmers in southern Kyushu were so far from the centers of power in, in mainland Japan that nobody was really even aware of what they were doing. So there's very little written record about early shochu production in Kyushu. Next slide, please. So Japanese shochu, this is, this is what arrives. Um, <clears throat> started out as rice, water, yeast, and koji. So basically the same as uh, UQ awamori, although the koji strains can vary and we don't really know what koji strain was being used in early shochu production. It may have been yellow koji if they were familiar with using that to make sake, uh, but again, fermented and then single pot distilled. And today about 90% or more of shochu is made in Kyushu uh, down here in Southern Japan. Next slide, please. And again, that's the kanji for shochu. Next slide, please. So what is shochu made from? Go ahead. So again, we mentioned koji. So we have the yellow koji, which is usually for sake production. We have black koji, which is that ancient mold from Okinawa. And awamori must be made from black koji. And then we have white koji, or Aspergillus kawachi, which is actually a mutation of black koji that was discovered in a laboratory by Professor Kawachi in 1923. And he actually got a mold named after him. Uh, this is what's actually used most often in shochu production today, simply because it's easier to use than yellow or black koji. Uh, black koji is really, really aggressive. It's a very strong mold. And so uh, keeping the distillery clean uh, can be difficult with, when working with black koji. And then yellow koji, because you don't have the acidic, acidity added to the fermentation, it's harder to make uh, clean fermentations down here in Southern Japan, while white koji does create that acidity. Uh, so that's what's usually made to make shochu, but shochu can actually be made from any of these. Next slide, please. All right, so I'd like to take a little bit of a historical interlude here. Uh, I did want to talk about history. Uh, remember the fishermen who are trading goods. Next slide. Uh, here's just an, an image of some fishermen uh, off the coast of Japan. Now you see Tsushima Island uh, here on this map of, of feudal Japan. Uh, and then you also see this map from Korea Tsushima Island appears as well. And so Tsushima was actually a location where a lot of trade happened between fishermen because it's situated right there in the Strait of Japan between Korea and Japan. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And near there is actually Iki Island. So Iki is historically important in Shochu. 
Next slide. Because the local samurai decided that they did not like the fact that the local fishermen and farmers were distilling their rice because rice was the taxable commodity uh, in Japan at the time. And so if, if the fishermen were able to ferment and distill their rice harvest before, uh, before the samurai came around to collect their taxes, they wouldn't know how much to tax. So the samurai made it illegal to make uh, shochu to, to distill rice into spirits. Next slide. Uh, so necessity, of course, is the mother of invention. So Iki barley shochu was born. So we believe that Iki Island is where barley shochu was first produced in Japan. Today, it's produced in lots of other prefectures, lots of other regions, but there are still seven distilleries on Iki Island uh, making traditional barley shochu. Next slide, please. So another historically significant event happens when the Satsuma domain in southern Kyushu invades Ryukyu. So the Ryukyu kingdom was invaded by the Satsuma domain uh, in 1609. Next slide, please. Now, this was historically significant because Ryukyu becomes a vassal state to Satsuma. The Satsuma domain, they didn't have strong uh, open water sailing skills, so they weren't really interested in trying to govern uh, the Ryukyu kingdom, which spreads over hundreds, hundreds and thousands of nautical miles or, or kilometers with hundreds of islands. Uh, so they simply turned Ryukyu into a vassal state. So Ryukyu started paying tribute to the Satsuma domain, and the Satsuma domain shared that uh, that revenue with the uh, shogun. Uh, and it's a way that the Satsuma domain became quite powerful in feudal Japan. Next slide, please. The other thing that made them powerful is not just that tribute they were getting from uh, Ryukyu, but the other was they actually captured the Amami Islands for themselves. And the Amami Islands, they turned into sugar plantations. And at this time, sugar was a, a very valuable commodity. And so this made the domain itself a lot of money uh, outside of just that tribute. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Satsuma domain, you can see, is way down there in southern Kyushu, about as far from Tokyo as you could get in feudal Japan. Now, this is before Hokkaido became part of Japan. So if you look at that map, you can see that Satsuma is just about as far as you can get away from, from Tokyo, from Edo. Mm -hmm. Uh, yet Satsuma became an extremely powerful uh, and influential domain in the country. Next slide, please. So another thing that happened in the Satsuma domain was the arrival of sweet potatoes in 1705. So a little under 100 years after uh, the Satsuma domain invaded the UQ, they imported sweet potatoes uh, from the UQ, from Okinawa, into Satsuma in southern Japan. And it turned out that the sweet potatoes grew very, very well in this rocky volcanic soil that rice really refused to grow in. Next slide, please. And in 1732, so about 30 years later, there was a massive crop failure. And peasants throughout Kyushu, especially northern and central Kyushu, ended up dying of starvation because the rice and, and other grains uh, failed to grow well. But the Satsuma domain was um, was saved because of the sweet potato. Next slide, please. So the Satsuma domain, they were saved from famine. And this was such a historically significant moment in their history that the fisherman who brought the potato back from Okinawa is still remembered. And his, uh, sorry, previous slide, his, uh, his name is remembered. Like how many fishermen from the 1700s have their name remembered? He even still has his, his tomb in, uh, in Satsuma, in Kagoshima. Uh, Maeda Reemon, and there are a number of uh, shochu brands actually named after him. Next slide, please. So all that sugar cane, remember that? Uh, next slide. That is now used to make uh, uh, what is called kokuto sugar shochu. Uh, it used to be called amami awamori, interestingly, uh, back in the day. But this is shochu made from this kokuto sugar. It's a, it's a roughly refined sugar uh, that's... Um, very little molasses is removed, and it's a very nutrient-rich, delicious, delicious sugar source from southern Japan. And there are now 28 active kokuto shochu distilleries today in, in the Amami Islands, which, again, those islands were captured by the Satsuma domain and became part of modern Kagoshima prefecture because of that uh, invasion. Next slide, please. Uh, so that kokuto sugar shochu can only be made in the Amami Islands. Next slide. 
Now, a couple other styles that I'd like to mention before we get into the full list is soba or buckwheat shochu, which was developed in Miyazaki in the 1970s. It's still predominantly made in Miyazaki, although some of it is now being made in Nagano, which is famous for its buckwheat. Uh, and then kastori or sake leaves shochu is a very traditional style that's actually made throughout Japan. Next slide, please. So this is why I really love the kastori style is that the sake leaves could potentially be a fertilizer for the next year's rice harvest, but they have residual alcohol, which would be damaging to the roots of, of the rice plants. So what you do is you distill those lees to extract the alcohol, and then you can use those lees as fertilizer for the next year's harvest. You have this really nice closed loop cycle uh, of no waste, which I really, really admire. Next slide, please. And then of course, everyone loves a souvenir in Japan. It's a gift giving culture. Uh, people are constantly buying gifts for people. And whenever you travel, you often will buy souvenirs. Next slide, please. And this, this will go kind of quick. So uh, you can basically make uh, shochu from all of these different ingredients that you're about to see. So different root vegetables. Next slide. Uh, aloe, saffron, spring onions, mushrooms, corn. Corn's not strange for Westerners. Seaweed. Next slide, please. Uh, several different kinds of seaweed, actually. Next slide different freshwater plants, next slide, uh, different kinds of nuts or seeds, next slide. Uh, so seeds, now you can't make shochu out of plums, but you can make it out of the pit of the plum. Uh, again, an example of no, no waste of materials. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, different kinds of green tea or, or black tea, next slide. Uh, different garden variety vegetables, uh, onions, green peppers, tomatoes, etc. Uh, bamboo can even be used, different kinds of other Japanese traditional ingredients such as kabocha pumpkin or uh, red beans. Next slide. Uh, you can actually make uh, shochu out of palm dates there on the left and also out of cactus. Uh, very, very strange ingredients to me given that I've never seen uh, cactus in Japan. But next slide, please. Uh, different kinds of green leafy vegetables. Those two on the bottom are actually shiso, uh, which I'm sure people are familiar with. If you go to a sushi restaurant, often your sashimi is lying on top of shiso, a really lovely aromatic herb. Next slide, please. Uh, different kinds of flowers. Now you can't make it from cows. That would be cruel, but next slide, please. You can make shochu from, next slide, please. From milk. Uh, you can make it from whole milk, skim milk, or whey powder. Uh, all of those can be used in shochu uh, fermentation and distillation. Next slide, please. So overall, there are about 54 different approved ingredients, depending on how you classify. By far, the most popular is sweet potato, followed very closely by barley. So that's probably 80 to 90% of the market. Uh, then rice. You can see kastori is just a sliver, a bit historically important. And uh, then that the soba and, and black sugar Kokodo sugar probably account for another five to seven percent. And then finally, those gift shop shochus are probably one percent of the market. The, I guess a lot of those are aromatic shochus is how we describe them. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, 90 percent of shochu or more is produced in Kyushu. There are actually four WTO geographic indications and one J Japanese indication. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a map of Kyushu along with the islands that spread out down uh, south of there, you can see the Kokuto Shochu in the Amami Islands. The UQ Awamori is still uh, predominantly made in Okinawa. If it's made in Okinawa in the traditional style, then it classifies as WTO designation. Sorry, the Kokuto Shochu designation is a Japanese uh, protected designation. And then Satsuma Shochu is sweet potato shochu made in Kagoshima, where the, the potato was first introduced. Kuma Shochu is the uh, bread basket or rice produced for the furthest south you can produce high quality rice in Japan. And so kuma shochu uh, is, is rice shochu from Kumamoto and then that iki shochu, the barley shochu from Nagasaki. Next slide, please. And I'd just like to mention, I think you probably have picked up on a little, little bit, but I think shochu is really a terroir driven spirit in many ways, uh, which I think makes it analogous to mezcal or pisco, uh, or some, some styles of rum. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, um, Sakurajima, which is actually the most active volcano on Earth. And I took this picture uh, riding up the train early in the morning and uh, on my way to a distillery to, to, to work. And next slide, please. 
about 15 minutes later, this was the view out the window. It was erupting. It was er for a while, it was erupting three to four times a day. I don't think it's quite so frequent anymore, but still a very active volcano. Next slide, please. This is in Kagoshima Prefecture. And all of that ash ends up in the soil. And the sweet potatoes actually really, really love all that minerality. And in some satsuma shochu, the sweet potato shochu from this region, if the potatoes were harvested close enough to the volcano, you'll get some ashiness in the final distillate, which is a really fascinating expression. Next slide, please. So this is just a very quick overview of the shochu making process. We're going to start the video uh, momentarily. Uh, but just so you understand, there is a first fermentation or a primary fermentation started, followed by a second fermentation or main fermentation. And this is really what defines what kind of shochu it is. Uh, then we have the distillation and then an aging or maturation, dilution, filtration, and bottling. Uh, first fermentation is really like a shubo for sake making, where you have your water, your koji, and your yeast. And that koji can be grown on any number of different substrates, rice, barley, etc. Then the second fermentation is where you would add that main ingredient. So anyway, why don't we uh, jump from here? I don't, maybe there's one more slide before we can go to the video. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to, to finish up this portion of the talk with a, a quote that a, a wise Toji once told me that shochu is three things. It's a people, place, and ingredients. Uh, and that's really what I think makes it so special for, um, for as, as Japan's native spirit. So, all right, why don't we uh, switch to the video? Uh, and anyway, that's, that's us. Yeah, so, uh, as Christopher mentioned, I'm the author of The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, and Christopher and I actually are co hosts for a podcast called uh, Japan Distilled. And you can find me on social media at Japan Distilled. So, all right, so let's start the video, and I'll do my best to narrate. As Christopher mentioned, I have not worked at Fuji Distillery. I've not actually been to Fuji Distillery, but I've, I'm familiar enough with the process that I should be able to make my way through this. I appreciate everybody's messages in the in the chat. I pre thank you for the compliments. I, it's my pleasure to, to share this. And Christopher could easily do this talk, but I think I get uh, this talk because he, he lives in Tokyo and can have the fun part with the snacks and everything. So this is Fuji Distillery in Oita. Um, the exterior, you can see, is a pretty traditional uh, building. Uh, they make a number of different styles of barley shochu. Uh, Oita is, is famous for 100% barley shochu. And they're using this Toyonoshi barley from Oita Prefecture, which is important because a lot of barley shochu is made with imported barley. But Fuji is using local Oita grown barley uh, for their shochu. So you can see it's actually pearled barley. So unlike uh, whiskey or beer where you would use a malted barley, uh, this is actually pearled. So it's polished. And that allows the koji to infiltrate the grain uh, for uh, converting those starches to sugars. If you were to inoculate koji on unpolished barley, it wouldn't work. Uh, so here they use this drum style koji machine. So what, what this machine does is it's actually steaming the barley, the, the raw barley, the, the raw polished barley has been put into this drum and then it's steamed. Uh, and the steaming obviously uh, Loose, you know, softens the barley and, and makes it easier for the koji. The other thing that it does is the koji um, needs, it needs a hot, humid environment. So when you're inoculating it onto a freshly steamed grain, the koji can just start growing and, and, and going wild. And what it does is it grows, these haifa actually grow into each individual grain and start breaking up the, the starches into sugars. And as it's doing that, it's actually releasing heat. Um, but this is the steaming process. You can see they're probably doing, I can't, I'm not sure exactly how many uh, kilograms of barley they're using, but it looks like quite a bit. Uh, here, they're actually adding the koji spores. So the, the distilleries themselves don't grow their own koji. That would be a full-time job. So they buy koji from, from local, uh, I think there's uh, four or five koji producers in Japan to make all different styles. And you would choose different kojis based on what you want to express. Um, so now what they do after that steaming is they move the koji, because uh, this is a larger scale uh, facility. Uh, this is probably a medium sized distillery, I would say. Um, they're moving the, co the steamed barley into the, the koji room. There are actually drums in which you can, you can make the koji itself, but it's, it's pretty common 
uh, in these larger scale facilities to have these koji rooms, which is what this is a, an automated koji room as opposed to the traditional style. Um, but they're pumping now all of that grain gets essentially sucked into the, the koji room. And inside of this room is where they'll, um, they've already inoculated, but they will, uh, they will maintain humidity and temperature in order to uh, have the koji grow optimally on the grain. And this process usually lasts close to two days. Um, you can see this one, they actually have an automated mixer in there that will keep, keep aerating the koji. Koji is an, an aerobic organism, so it needs oxygen to survive. Uh, and so you're constantly trying to aerate, you're constantly trying to provide fresh oxygen for the koji so that it can thrive in that hot and humid environment. Inside these, these rooms, once he gets all of the grain in there and he closes the door, it's probably going to be around 35 degrees Celsius, about 90, what's that, 90, 95 degrees, close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and then about 70% humidity. Now they use black koji, uh, so the awamori style, grown on barley. Now it still looks kind of a gray, it doesn't really look black, but that's because it hasn't fully gone to spore. If it was allowed to fully go, go to spore, this would just be covered with black like we saw in that uh, previous photo. All of that kojified barley then goes into the first fermentation. So this is essentially like your shubo and sake. This is 100% kojified, koji inoculated barley with water and yeast. And this starts the fermentation process in what's called multiple parallel fermentation. It's similar to the process for sake, where you have the koji continuing to convert uh, uh, starches to sugars as the yeast is converting those sugars into alcohol. So you end up with a very efficient, very high alcohol fermentation. Um, this uh, tube that he's putting into this tank here, it's actually blowing air into the tank. And so what he's doing, again, is providing oxygen for the koji. So the koji is uh, aerobic, the yeast is anaerobic. So yeast doesn't want to be exposed to oxygen. But when you expose the yeast to oxygen, you agitate the yeast and agitated yeast puts off aromas that we like, that we actually want in the final product. So you're actually, you're, you're annoying the yeast and you're keeping the koji alive through this process, but you're actually getting two benefits from aerating like this. Uh, this gas injection, because it's such a large fermentation, is just a, a more efficient way than trying to hand stir these pots. Uh, then we distill. And as I mentioned, uh, shochu and awamori are single pot distilled, uh, which is a traditional method. Now, shochu makers typically use a stainless, uh, stainless steel still, uh, which is different than the traditions in Europe, where often copper stills are used. And uh, the Japanese use the stainless stills because they're more efficient and they're more, they're more reliable. Uh, copper is a harder metal to, to work with and, and they need more maintenance. And because you've polished the grains, you have less of the organic compounds that create the off flavors in Western distilled traditions. So the stainless still is, is, uh, is, is sufficient for shochu production. Um, I just sort of love this video where the, the, the liquid goes cloudy and then it's going to clarify here in a second. Uh, as the distillation starts. And the, the, the interesting thing with shochu is you actually keep the heads and it's a very long run. You're not taking segments like you do in other spirits traditions. To so keep the heads, you keep the hearts and you keep the tails. Um, yeah, here it's about to go clear, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is actually a monitor that will tell you the alcohol percentage of what's coming out of the still at that point in time. Uh, and so you're monitoring this and then the, the master distiller will know when to cut when to stop the distillation based on what alcohol percentage is coming off, as he knows from experience when off flavors start to enter uh, the distillation. So he's going to stop it before those off flavors come in. So uh, pretty cool to see this up close like this. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have a, we may not see the entire still. Oh, there it is. So pretty big one. This looks like it's made by Royal Still in Osaka. Um, so you see the swan neck and uh, some smaller distilleries will have a single still. This is actually multiple stories. This looks like about a two or three story tall still. Um, and the fermentation is placed right into that cauldron at the bottom. And then it's essentially usually jacketed with steam or direct steam injected to, to create the boil. And you can see a pretty strong boil. What's happening here is alcohol actually evaporates at a lower boiling temperature than water. So when you, when you put the fermentation in here, the alcohol is going to evaporate first. Now, the reason a lot of uh, drinks traditions cut the heads is because the heads have 
um, other kinds of alcohols, things that we don't actually want to drink usually. Uh, but that's the reason that shochu is rested after distillation is to let some of those volatile alcohols uh, blow off and evaporate. And aging is, is certainly part of this. And one of my favorite styles is actually ceramic pot aging, which is a very traditional style. It's a little bit like the amphora, amphora that are used in Europe for uh, Grecian wines or Georgian wines. Uh, but here at, at Fuji, what they actually do is they have this aging cave and they, they age their ceramic pots in this very cool, uh, looks pretty humid environment. And these, these pots are unglazed. These are pretty large. These are probably around I would say between 600 and 800 liters. Uh, you see they actually do some tank aging. Those green vessels on the side there on the left side are, are enamel lined tanks. So they are doing some tank aging in this cave as well. But those pots as unglazed ceramic will actually allow some, some, some breathing. And so there is some actual interaction with the spirit uh, and it'll give you some oxidization like you would get with uh, barrel aging or with other styles of aging. The enamel tank is inert and it's, it, it doesn't really allow for that. So you get a more neutral expression. The ceramic can also add minerality, especially if the pots stay for a long time or in the, the spirit stays in the pots for a long time. Uh, and here's just some bottling. I guess they were excited about bottling some seasonal uh, products here. So we got these, um, looks like ceramic, what are those tigers or some sort of great cat, it looks like. Um, you'll find this at some of the more traditional distilleries where they do these seasonal packagings of these. These are essentially designed for gifts uh, for people. It looks like a tiger. Um, and uh, of course, most of their products are gonna be bottled in glass, uh, but you do sometimes get these uh, ceramic decanters, uh, which uh, some people like to collect. So I think that's pretty much the end of the video. So I thought maybe um, we could have a little bit of a chat if we have time. I actually don't know how long that ran. Um, might be right on time. Got a few minutes, I think. Yeah, maybe. I think, Stephen, you, you, uh, you timed it perfectly. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we do, have, we do have some time for a couple of questions, I think. And uh, the, one of the questions that came up in the chat was, um, in term, two questions actually, in, in terms of aging shochu, mm -hmm. uh, what types of vessels are used and how long is typical for aging within the shochu industry? Sure, I think uh, the, the, the most common is, are those enamel line tanks because they don't impart any flavor, uh, but then you do have the traditional method of the ceramic pots and then you also have uh, usually oak barrels, but other woods are used. Uh, for, for aging shochu. There's some cedar aged shochu. There's uh, kusunoki, uh, which is a, a, a large indigenous hardwood here in Japan. Uh, there's what cherry, cherry wood from the, from the cherry blossom trees. There's chestnut tree, a number of different woods that are used in shochu aging. But most of it is in those uh, tanks for an inert uh, expressions. So you're really tasting those base ingredients. That's the beauty of the single pot distillation is you're going to taste what it's made from. And if you start aging it in things that impart flavor, you're gonna mute that, you're gonna disguise that. Uh, now in awamori, which we talked about at the beginning, that's actually often aged in ceramic. Uh, the, there's the entire shitsugi method, which is a little bit like the sherry solera method in which you're constantly adding new spirit to, to older spirit um, uh, as you drink off uh, what's, whatever's in your pot. And people will do that at home. I've got some pots here on the floor um, of, of awamori that I'm aging at home. Um, yeah, so that's, that's typically, I think, how, how it's aged. How long would it be aged in wood? I mean, the, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, I know the National Tax Agency helped sponsor this, but the, there's a tax issue, uh, which is that the makers are actually taxed at the time of production. And so it costs them money. They're paying that forward, right? They're paying that tax. And so if they age it for a long time, uh, they're sort of out that money for a while. So what ends up happening is there's a lot of shochu or awamori that's aged young, usually in uh, what, three to six months is a lot of product uh, out to a year. Some of the smaller distilleries will hold it a little bit longer. You do have some that specialize in aged products and that's just decisions that they've made. Uh, Awamori has a tradition of aging, sometimes long-term aging, uh, but there's also the young Awamori, so. Um, another question about aging uh, when comparing, and this is a, the, the previous question was from, um, from Monica. This next question is from Alex, and he asks if, if shochu 
and sake go bad over time? Shochu does not. Yeah. Uh, as a distilled spirit, it's inert. It's, it's not going to change any more than a whiskey or a rum or any other distilled alcohol would change in the bottle. Uh, sake can be kept if, if you maintain the conditions. It is going to change though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to age like a wine. But I've had some beautiful namazake, so un, unpasteurized sake that's been aged for for years, as long as you're doing a nice job in your in your bottle maintenance. But it's not necessarily something you want to do at home unless you have experience or or have how been trained how to do it. What's that? How about after you open the bottle? How much uh, then you're then you probably should drink it pretty quickly, yeah. right? With sake, it's much more like a wine. Yeah, so you got to drink it. Yeah, which is not a big problem. Sure. <laughs> All right, good. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think the, the questions are starting to come fast and furious, so we might want to hold off a little bit. Yeah, why don't, we, why don't we keep some of those for the end? I'm, I'm, I'm excited to start tasting some things, and I'm, I, want, I want a snack. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> oh, so you do have snacks. I do. I got, a, I got the kit yesterday. Oh, you got the whole kit. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I, was, I didn't get the cocktails, though. I guess I have to make those myself. <laughs> It's, but you've got the tea in the kit, so. Uh. That's right. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, um, one very cool thing that everybody saw in that video, and, uh, and I mentioned it at the top, is there's a decanter right at the end of the video, the, the tiger, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the gift for people, you know, we're, it's a lottery, basically. But if you complete the questionnaire, um, we have a tiger for several lucky winners. So don't forget to fill out the questionnaire at the end of this um, this session. Am, am I eligible? What's that? Am I eligible? <laughs> no, um, unfortunately. Go ahead. Fill, fill it out. <laughs> you never know. Maybe maybe other people won't, and they'll have some going spare. You might get one. You never know. <laughs> but seeing this right, those decanters are collectibles, um, folks. They you know they're very often gifts, and they, they tend to be kind of uh, mantle pieces yep. because they're they're really regal. Um, so let's. How about this? Let's. Before we move on to the next session, it's part two of this entire endeavor, which is going to involve a little bit more information about shochu and awamori, how it's different from other traditions, and then a food pairing with the snacks that you have in front of you, and then finally some uh, cocktail mixing. Before we do that, let's have a kampai. All right. Sounds good. So, yeah, we're yeah, we've been waiting very patiently with all of this beautiful shochu and awamori in front of you. And we haven't done how to drink it. I'm sure you probably are enjoying something. <laughs> and if you're not, let's start. Um, we're going to use the uh, Bungo no Sapo, the, the barley shochu from the distillery that you just took a virtual tour of, uh, Fuji Shugo. And we'd like you to pour a little bit of that in, into a glass. Don't drink it straight out of this thing. <laughs> Well, you know what? And Wait, your camera's not it, and, and we do need to keep a little bit for the tasting. We're going to go through all of these um, later with uh, with food pairing. So make sure you save a little bit for later. Very fair point. So the way that Mark and I have it prepared here is we just poured some over ice. That would be a nice way to enjoy it. It's a 25% ABV, 100% barley shochu made in Oita, in the Oita barley tradition. And it's great on the rocks. So uh, without further ado, Steve, you got something? I do. I just poured myself some. Okay, great. Excellent. Oh, nice cup. Beautiful cup. Yeah. Thank all right. You. Well, from all of us here in uh, Japan, both in Tokyo and Fukuoka and elsewhere, we've got some people from the JSS downtown that are, are on standby. Uh, from all of us here to all of you out there all around the world, a very hearty and heartfelt kanpai. 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 See, and this is, that's something often. Awesome. Okay, that's a very, that had a bunch of the notes that you can often expect from an oita barley shochu. And that is, of course, the bready and toasty, nut, toasty notes from the barley, but then also some fruit notes. I mean, there's often a little bit of banana, maybe some light pear or melon in there. It's a really interesting style. It tends to be quite smooth and very sessionable. So sip slowly and sip whole not. <laughs> We're going to uh, move on. Great. To, I'm going. To, uh, yeah, and I think. Yeah, this, this I'm. I'm just going to say thank you and appreciate everybody's attention. And I'll be back for the Q and A later. For now, I just get to enjoy as a guest. So All I'll right. see you really soon. Please take over the monitoring the chat for us. We'll do. Okay. Um, and I'm going to 
Oh, I need I need the ability to host too. Um, so please allow me to uh, share if you can. Um, and I'm going to, of course, use my little device here. If, if I get sharing rights, please let me share. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about how Shorochu and Awamori are different from the other drinks traditions from around the world. And, and there's a lot of confusion. I mean, how is Shorochu different from sake? How is shochu different from soju made in Korea? It's a very common, confusing point for people. How's it different from dai? How's it different from uh, rum? Because there's there's shochu made from there's shochu made from cocoa sugar. And how's it different from whiskey? Because a lot of shochu is cask aged. So let me let me try this now. Nope, not yet. Um, so just just to I'm just going to go through this uh, straight to camera. Um, let's talk about shochu versus sake. What's the major difference? Number one, sake is brewed, shochu and awamori are distilled. It's really that simple. They're entirely different families of drinks. Sake is made more in the wine and beer side of the alcohol, beverage alcohol world. Shochu and awamori are spirits, as Stephen said before. Um, they're distilled. They tend to have higher alcohol content, and, and they also there's a little there's a little bit stricter rules for shochu and awamori in terms of things that you can add after uh, distillation. So that's that's basically the big difference. The other the other difference, even though both all of these things are made with koji, shochu and shochu can be made from fifty three different ingredients. It is the most diverse spirit in the world. There is nothing that can compare to it. And everything tastes like what it's made from. This is a barley shochu. It tastes like barley because it's single pot distilled. But later we're going to see these all taste very different. And that's because of a minimal amount of distillation. All right. Sake is only made from rice. That's all you need. I'm sure you already knew that. Moving on. Uh, let's talk about the difference between Shochu and soju. Okay, soju is made in Korea. Shochu is made in Japan. I know they sound the same, but please trust me. They are incredibly different. They should never be confused. Uh, soju is generally, and we're talking about the small green bottles that many people know of. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. That does not use single pot distillation. That uses a vodka still, a column still, a patent still. Uh, it's a modern still. The same. Similar still to what we use to refine oil, it can create a almost pure ethanol. And that's what they do. They make a 96% alcohol drink that doesn't taste like what it's made from anymore. Then they water it down. And for green bottle soju, they add sweetener and lots of sweetener. Flavorings. Yeah, lots of. And these days, the most popular ones are like watermelon flavored, yep. pear flavored, and melon flavored. That's great. Chilled with spicy Korean food. Don't that's like the perfect, perfect <laughs> match. It's a palate cleanser, it's sweetener with the spice, it's good. That is so different from these old 500 plus year old drinks made in Japan, which are single pot distilled from approved ingredients. No additives other than water or thyme are allowed. That's important. So it's very much about the fermentation. The fermentations that Stephen showed us are so important. They have to be so pure and so clean because what you have is what you get. You get one attempt using the still, a traditional pot still. And if it doesn't taste good, you've lost a lot of time. In well, in a lot of ways, it's also a little bit similar to sake in that, you know, the, what you get at the end of the fermentation is, is what you're going to, what you're, you're going to taste. That's so exactly, that's a great A lot point. of care and uh, um, sort of hygiene that needs to go into it to make sure you don't end up with off flavors or um, other things that might affect the, the quality of the, the finished shochu. That's a fantastic comment. Yeah. And, and that means that you, uh, people making shochu, awamori, sake in Japan are masters at managing that fermentation. And they're mm -hmm. long fermentation. We're talking more than two weeks long. I used to make beer when I was in the States. The fermentation can take that long, but you know you're, it doesn't need to. Um, and for whiskey fermentations, it's generally much, much, much shorter. So it's a real attention to detail. It's a craft, 
it's it's a crap from start to finish to make this delicious, beautiful aromatic fermentation that you're going to just use. You're going to pass it through the still once. It takes a couple of hours, and boom, so it's just warm, right? Or a whole bunch. Do we want to go into the difference between honkaku and shoju? Yeah, sure. I can. Okay, so there's there is another type of shoju which isn't really shoju, but thanks thanks uh, tax office. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, it's used to make cocktails a lot of times. Um, and by that I mean like RTV canned cocktails, too high. Okay. A, a high ball, a too high is a show too high ball, right? Too high. And they often use, or they use, now they use vodka too, but they use this multiply distilled show chew that is a lot like a vodka. Now that is, that is also technically by tax law show chew. But everything we're talking about today is known as honkaku shoju. H O N K A K U. Honkaku means authentic or the real thing. The real, real deal. deal. Yeah, exactly. And that is single pot distilled shoju made from approved ingredients and their kōdui. All right. This um, kōdui, what is called the multiply distilled, the column distilled shoju, is not even actually really made in Japan. It's, it's, I think it's produced in another part of the world. They bring it over here and then they redistill it. And then they use it in lots of other drinks. To make chuhai, they use it in pubs and izakaya to make um, uronhai and sours and that sort of thing. But it's a very different type of, of uh, spirit. What we're talking about today is the old school stuff. Um, so I've talked about sake and soju. Let me next talk about vodka. Vodka is like soju, it's the same type of column distillation. It doesn't taste like what it's made from. It tastes like a quote unquote neutral, neutral meaning ethanol spirit. Uh, that's about all I have to say. So if you ever hear somebody calling shochu Japanese vodka, that's not very nice. <laughs> all right, uh, moving on to rum. We can make shochu from cocoa sugar. It can only be made in the Amami Islands by uh, Japanese tax law. If you make the same drink, any if you make it here in Tokyo, we can't call it kokuto sugar shoji. We have to call it a kokuto spirit. It would be a different tax classification. And this is made with rice and kokuto. So is it a rum? Are there any rums with rice? You know, not so much, probably. <laughs> so I think there's a clear difference right there. Another difference is that with aged rums, they tend to get quite dark. Another rule that is in place to control what is shochu and what is not shochu is you can't age shochu very long in oak. In other words, you will never see a honkaku shochu, whether it's kokuto or whether it's barley or something else, that is as dark as a whiskey or a, an aged rum. It's just not going to happen. You'll see the darkness being, we don't have one here today. But really, just kind of a straw, yep. yellow, light gold color. That's as dark as it can get. So there's another big difference, and that's by uh, by regulation, right? Uh, in order to be able to call it a honkak shochu, you can't go beyond a certain coloration. Exactly. There's a spectrum of, of color darkness. Here's like completely paper white to black, and you can only go about this far into the straw yellow color and still call it a honkak shochu. So the, there's another difference. So it's the use of rice. And for uh, dark dark rums versus uh, barrel aged cocktail shochu, the, the hue is completely different. Mm -hmm. Last and not least is whiskey. A lot of a lot of makers are barrel aging their shochu these days. A lot of the ex bourbon casks end up here in Japan. It's a huge market for them. And the same thing, the same hue restriction. It's a 0 0.08 on a, a spectro, spectro photometer reading machine that measures the, the amount of color of the amount of hue. And, and then also, um, you know, you're not allowed to use malt to make shochu. Now, in this leaflet that you receive, it says malted rice everywhere, malted barley. That's an, a very common translation, but it's incorrect. It's not legally possible to use rice, and it's not physically or biologically possible to malt a grain that has been polished. Because if you remove the germ, it can't germinate. 
they can't start the growth process. And that's what molting is all about. I don't have time to get into what molting is, so please Google that. Um, instead of malting in Japan, as Stephen explained, we use cool. We, we propagate, we sprinkle koji spores on steamed grains, generally, usually rice. And that is a major, major difference between even a barley, barley show too, which has koji used, and the whiskey, all right? Um, another thing is the number of distillations. Whiskey is almost always at least double distilled. I know a very yeah. few single distilled whiskey. In fact, I don't know if I've ever tried one. Usually it's double, triple distilled, possibly even more. Many times it's a blend of a column or grain whiskey and then a and then a pot distillation. Shoju, awamori. Once the pot still, that's it. What you have is what you get. It tastes like what it's made from. And that's the magic of it. That's the magic of koji. That's the magic of the traditional. But style. that is kind of an interesting thing, though. Um, you know, we talked about the differences between uh, rum and, and whiskey and shochu. But when you have a, a, a shochu made from kokuto, the one today is, is not so much the case, but there are some kokuto shochu that actually do taste a bit like rum because of the fact that it's made from sugar. Um, and you have some aged uh, shochus that do taste a bit like whiskey because you have that, that aging process yeah. in the cast. And actually, while we're talking about let's just crack these open. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Let's start with this kokuto sho shoju, actually. We've tried some barley. Um, we're going to move on to yayoi, which is a kokuto shoju made in the Amami Island. And as soon as you, as soon as you open it up, we're going to drink this straight because we're professionals. <laughs> Everybody watching is a professional right now. This is how... This is how you should do it if you're trying something for the first time, just to get a little sip of it. 30% ABV, rice starter fermentation, and then kokuto, this dark, almost unrefined, uh, this cake sugar is added to the secondary. As Mark just said, when you put your nose in it, you get a very nice, light uh, caramel, a little bit of like molasses mm -hmm. quality to it, a little bit of grassiness. A little anise. Yeah, a little bit of anise, the, the black licorice flavor. And when you take a sip of it, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of sweet, but not too sweet. There are no residual sugars in shochu, which is a magical thing. If you're, I'm not going to tell you that drinking is healthy, because it's not. Okay? No matter what anybody says, it's not healthy. But if you're looking to cut your calories, Shochu is a good way to go. There are no residual sugars. There are no additives allowed. It's arguably the lowest calorie mass produced spirit in the world. So let's take a That has flavor. That also has flavor. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's delightful. It's, it's amazing how something that's 30% ABV can still be so. And, and we haven't chilled it. This is at room temperature. Exactly. Um, you can obviously chill it, have it over ice. You can, um, you can warm it up with a little bit of hot water to really bring out those, those aromas. Yeah. Um, but we're going straight today just to, to get that, that get impact the, from the, get the real thing. Yep. Let's continue here. Let's move on now. We're going to go boom, 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 boom. So don't drink too much of, each, of any one of these so you can come back to them for the pairing. Let, next, let's move on to rice. Okay. This is my sangetsu. And it's made in Kumamoto Prefecture. This is the this is the um, area where Kumashoju is made, and it's a hundred percent rice. And this is lovely. You're gonna you if you're into if you're into um, you're into sake at all, you might get a little bit something familiar from that. A lot of the the sake notes move into. And you get yogurt and you get, you know, from the dairy family, you get some grains and you get a lot of tropical notes. And I think that what we're getting in, in here is, yeah, a little bit of melon, a little bit of bubble gum, a little banana. Yep. Banana all over the place. And again, this is, we're drinking it straight. This would be good on the rocks. Oh, it would be. I like the, the, the bubblegum comparison. I never really thought about it, but it, I definitely, definitely got a lot of bubblegum there. And this is, so we've had three now, barley, kokuto, and rice. They're completely different. They are completely different characters. And there are thousands of shochu expressions and brands made every year in Japan. And it's, I'm telling you, it is, it is the deepest and, and most winding rabbit hole you can find. <laughs> So I hope yeah. join me. I'm way down the rabbit hole already. Mark's down there too. 
And Stephen's well down the road. <laughs> Come on down, it's comfy. And, and the, the crazy thing is that, you know, we've lined up different uh, base materials here. So you can really, really see the difference. But even within one base material, like just with the barley shochu or just with the kokuto, different brands, different distillation methods, yeah. um, the, you know, the small changes in the process can drastically affect the, the outcome of, of the flavor That's of the shochu. Uh, there are so many choices available to the toji, the master brewer, distiller. They can mess with temperature during the fermentation, different types of yeast, atmospheric the, pressure, atm yeah, atmospheric distillation, um, reduced pressure, pressure distillation. Uh, it's just, and then, and then, of course, all the different aging methods too. You just have so many choices and so many different ingredients. Look, there's 53 base ingredients. It is nuts. Let's move on to uh, a different product made with rice. Um, we're going to drink some alamoy. This is technically shochu's. Aunt? <laughs> Grandfather? Maybe. No, it's, a, it's a little older than shochu. <laughs> Awamori has been produced, we believe, a little longer than shochu. Um, just because of the... The Ryukyu Kingdom was a major trade hub, hub as, as Stephen said. And this is a 100% black koji rice spirit. Well, and it's... it's Wow, yeah, too, because yeah. this was made for rice too. Mine was made yeah. in rice, we're still on rice. <laughs> Completely different, right? It's also worth noting this is long grain rice, whereas uh, the other other rice was short grain rice. So it's the type of rice eaten in Japan, whereas uh, in the Ryukyu Kingdom, it was uh, Thai, Thai rice, uh, correct, uh, right. where it grows in a warmer, more humid climate. And oh, that's black koji. And it's, a, mm. it's old. That's it's meaty. meaty. It is meaty. It's <laughs> yeah. And it's 30% ABV. So it's a little bit more with the alcohol uh, than what we had just prior to that, which is 25. But both are made from rice, different type, slightly different fermentation methods, uh, different koji, but same pot still. So what you have is what you get. You really do get a very faithful representation of the quality of that fermentation. And that's something that is really, really special for Hong Kong Shochu and Halloween. Last but not least, let's move on to our sweet potato shochu expression. This is the Beni Komaki. Now, sweet potato shochu is probably the most diverse of all of the diverse subcategories of shochu. So why is that? There are more than five dozen, I think, I've heard people say six or seven dozen, but I always fall on five dozen varietals of sweet potato that are used to make sweet potato shochu. And we're talking from like, Paper white flesh, which is the most common, Kogane Sengan is the name of that sweet potato, all the way to the most ruby garnet, like this color, like in everything in here, uh, sweet potatoes. And they all express differently. In the middle, you've got yellow and orange sweet potatoes. And it is it is wild. There are some amazing sweet potato varieties used to make shochu. Some are easier than others. Some have higher starch content. Some have... Uh, some just turn into this gooey mess in the fermentation or are hard to clean, um, but they all express differently. Benny Komaki is a, oh, this hasn't been cracked yet. You get, the, you get a little bit of distillery air in there when you first crack it. And this is what would be called a purple sweet potato. Okay, but you know, exactly which purple? There's a bunch of them. You're going to smell it. As soon as you, I mean, I think probably a lot of people out there just like, oh, I know what a sweet potato smells like. I know what it tastes like. Well, there's a lot of different ways that sweet potatoes can express. Yeah. And this is one of them. This is this is a lot of fruitiness to this, isn't it? Yeah, it's very sweet. Got a little bit of citrus in there. But I mean, speaking of citrus, there are some uh, sweet potato shochu. I mean, they taste like oranges almost. You know, it's got a really, really strong. But this is. This, I think, is very balanced. It has a very uh, sweet potato flavor, sweet potato forward, if it's, you will. It, it's got the, it's on the, it's on the fruitier side of the spectrum. There's also sweet potato shochu expressions that are like a, like an old growth conifer forest, you know, and it's just, it's herbal, herbaceous, it's spicy, it's peppery. Uh, so it, there's so many different styles. And I think that this, for me, probably would work well with, with sparkling. Oh, absolutely. And with a lot of sweet potatoes, um, you can drink it with a little bit of hot water. 
which heats it up. It's great for winter, warms you up. But the other great thing is that it releases a lot of those aromatics um, as you, you put it in your mouth and it, it goes into your, um, into your nose and you can, you can smell those fragrances. So that's a really nice way to have it as well. And that's, that's absolutely how I normally drink sweet potato shows. I'm <laughs> kind of an old soul in that way. I'm an oyaji, as they say here in Japan. I drink uh, basically cut 50-50 sweet potato shoshu and hot water, the traditional style called oyuayu. And it's amazing for, um, for just really releasing those esters that Mark just mentioned. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the serving styles, and then we're going to get, oh, no, no, actually, let's not do that. Let's do pairings before we do serving styles. All right. Um, so where do you want to start? We've tried all let's, the uh, First, let's go ahead and get a little bit of mugi and dip these glasses here. And so in your kits, you should have received uh, some snacks and I will walk you through each of those uh, and what we're gonna be pairing it with. Um, you're free to obviously mix and match, but there's a, an order and um, sort of uh, pairings that I think make things taste better. So with the wine, wine pairing or a sake pairing, the goal is to make the food better, taste better and the, the wine or the sake taste better. And that's kind of what I was trying to go for here. Unfortunately, you know, we're not able to send uh, things refrigerated, so we're a little limited in terms of the choices, but um, hopefully this should be kind of a fun uh, series to go through. So, you know, we, we sort of ended uh, with the sweet potatoes. So let's start with that. Um, I've got some sweet potato chips here. Um, and this is, this is a pretty obvious pairing because sweet potatoes is gonna go with sweet potatoes, but um, I think it's a, it's a fun one to kind of start because you really get to see that, uh, you know, yes, this sweet potato here does taste like this shochu. So, uh, and we can leave that too, right? Yeah, okay. Would you re recommend food first, drink first? Anytime. Either way, I usually go drink, food, drink. Um, so just as you're you're kind of washing it down. Uh, that's, that's more adult than me. I usually go drink, 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 food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. We've, we've been drinking together. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I like, I like, there's a little bit of a, um, there's a, what's the word? There's a savoriness, yep. piece, which goes really well with it. Yeah, and you get the, the, the nuttiness that sort of brings out some of the fruit flavors uh, within the shochu. Um, so again, very obvious pairing. Another pairing that I really love to do with a lot of uh, sweet potato shochu is chocolate. Uh, uh, there are a lot of chocolates, like dark chocolates that go very well uh, because of the sweet flavor here. You got a lot of fruit in here and you know a lot of dark chocolate, depending on the terroir and where the chocolate comes from, you can get a lot of the similar flavor notes and they just sort of both synergize and, and make each other taste um, all that more interesting. Um, so, okay, we've, we've got the, the sweet potato down. Uh, and next, let's go to the awamori. awamori. Okay. Uh, have a little bit left here. Yeah. Yeah. So, the awamori, we are going to be pairing with uh, these chips here. These are, this is eringi. Oh, wow. uh, it's a king trumpet mushroom, uh, but it's been battered and fried. So, it's like a tempura uh, eringi. Um, and it's a uh, it's really nice because it's, it's crisp um, you get a lot of umami there, but uh, it's not too powerful. So we don't overpower the, the taste of the awamori. So I'm, this got, in the interim, this now has a little bit of a vanilla aroma. Yeah, 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 I, I'm getting the vanilla as well. Um, but I found with awamori, it tends to have kind of a, a meaty sort of a, a mushroomy, and I think it comes from the kurokoji. Uh -huh. um, so it goes really nicely with, uh, you know, uh, pork, chicken, um, but also mushrooms. Oh, wow. I love those chips. They're great, right? <laughs> I want those before it's dead. <laughs> oh, that was good. Yeah, I love the same, just the savory notes here. And this is an important thing to realize that, and, and a lot of people are going to know, drinks go with food. Mm -hmm. in, in Japan, they're, they're always together. Yeah, yeah, much. Well, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, in Spain, you have tapas. Um, and I think there's this culture in a lot of, a lot of uh, countries, but especially in Japan, um, the drinking culture is very much about um, eating and drinking at the same time. And part of that is just having the right pairing to go with the food. 
this is this is phenomenal. I love that one. All right. So how about all right? The so next, uh, let's go. Let's go with the rice. Actually, oh, with right. the with okay. the cheese. Got so it. we've got um, some cheese here. It's a uh, grilled cheese, and it's also got some cod, uh, dried cod on the back side. So that kind of papery oh, stuff wow. that you see on the back. Uh, this is a very popular sort of snack here in Japan. It's called uh, chi tada. Chi means cheese, and tada is cod. Uh, but this one has been roasted, so you get a little bit of uh, the smokiness from the roasting, uh, and it's very nice with the uh, sort of the smooth rice shochu. Rice shochu. The, the rice, the rice shochu tradition is a an excellent example of of shochu that is usually vacuum distilled. Mm -hmm. Usually, not always. There are some there are some old school atmospheric distilled styles, but this. This is a great example of that, where you're getting these super floral and fruity notes. And this, and there is dairy in it. There's absolutely a yogurt uh, quality to Well, there isn't dairy, just the flavor no, of no, dairy. No, 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 I'm sorry, there's no, there's no yogurt in it. It just expresses as, as dairy a little bit. So I'm gonna just, just take one of these. Uh, yeah, so I, I really like to pair like cheeses, um, in like a camembert or something very creamy, it goes very nicely with, uh, with the rice shochu. Yeah, that, shochu. That, makes, that makes complete sense. You see, and the alcohol, it cuts through the, the fat a little bit of the cheese and it helps spread it around your mouth. You get the umami from the cheese and that balances really nicely with that sort of fruitiness. You know, it's kind of like a cheese and dried fruit pairing. That's gorgeous. That's really good. The, yeah, cheese, cheese is, well, cheese works always and everywhere, but yeah, absolutely with rice shows. I think it probably could work with a couple others. I, I feel like cheese could work with whole stuff too, no? It does. It does work. I mean, it actually works with all of them. Um, maybe not the the emo, but the awamori for sure. Yeah. You get that sort of fermented uh, black koji. It also works with the mugi because the the mugi is uh, it's a little bit toasty, and you get a little bit of that smoky smokiness in there. Uh, it goes really nice with sort of the roasted cheese here. I love it. That was yeah. that was great. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go with the uh, kokuto. Speaking of kokuto, um, and for this one, I paired uh, skune, which is uh, it's chicken meatballs basically. And I know it's it's kind of a strange idea to this is a shelf stable uh -huh. uh, cooked chicken, but it's been um, uh, presumably pasteurized and, and vacuum sealed and or not vacuum sealed, but it's been sealed in here. Uh, so you should have some uh, chicken meatballs in there. And it's got a little toothpick on the back here if you want to use that, or or if you have a fork, you can use that as well. Okay. Um, but uh, this is uh, it's been uh, grilled with uh, charcoal and with some black pepper. So this is going to be really interesting with oh, the okay yeah. This is, uh, this reminds me, yeah, typical night with skewers and, and, uh, and shochu, one of my favorite ways to prepare. So, okay, so right okay. uh, the kokuto? I'm sorry, uh, I made a mistake. Is uh, it supposed to be the, the It's the, supposed to be the mugi. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, do yeah. That. <laughs> let's do that. Yep. So, um, backtrack there, yeah, so this is the, uh, we've got, do we have the mugi here? Yeah. We do have the mugi. Okay, okay. Sorry, right, going going with the barley. So um, it was actually the the welcome drink, the kanpai drink. Let's let's go to that. Although I'm, I guarantee it will work with the kokuto as well. You know what? Uh, okay, this is embarrassing. Uh, the kome was uh, okay. <laughs> this goes to show that the, some of these pairings works with a lot of things. The kome was actually supposed to be the chocolate cake. I, I changed the order a little bit. Uh, ah, but uh, the it's gonna go with this. Though. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Um, so let's go with the, the mugi, the barley shochu with the, the chicken and skune. So you get some of the smokiness and the, the black pepper with the. Um... That's so easy. That's, that's <laughs> so easy. No brainer. Yeah, that was easy. I love it. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mugi has a really uh, such a wide variety of flavors. Um, and on one end, on end of the spectrum, you have sort of a very nutty, uh, earthy, uh, smoky, sort of roasted flavor, almost like uh, you know the sort of wheat puffs, the roasted wheat puffs. Um, and then on, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And I think um, this this kind of heads to that direction. So great for barbecues um, if you're roasting meats. On the barbecue, yakitori, things like that uh, would be a, would be a wonderful pairing. Wow. Okay. So 
So love it. Yeah, the, the cheese is actually supposed to go with the kokutoshi too. Okay, <laughs> I will. I will happily do so that. So maybe we can go back to the cheese there and uh, and go with the kokuto. But again, uh, cheese also goes very well with the rice. I think my mistake there was I actually originally paired the rice with the cheese, but um, I found the rice actually works even better with something that we have coming up. That's why I, I sort of saved um, that for this, this other one. one. One of my favorite pairings that I've experienced was was actually a kokuto sugar shochu with a cheese fondue, which Ooh. was just nuts. It was it was really, well, it's decadent. I mean, you can imagine having one. I can just imagine. Does anybody have one of those fountains anymore? <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty old school, but that was really good. So yeah, cheese and shochu is amazing. Shochu is great because, yes, it's 25% it's ABV. I'm going to get into more standard styles of drinking it in a moment, but we're drinking it straight. You can do that, but typically people tend to water it down a little bit, or they tend to mix it a little bit. Uh, but this absolutely works as long as you don't drink drink too too much of it from one single glass. You can yeah. keep going. Um, so we're so, on to our yeah. Rice. Let's go to our dessert. So we're going to go back to the rice for this one. Yeah, we're going to the mine. And uh, I've got a kind of an unusual dessert here for us today. <laughs> um, so you, you have a can in your packet like this, um, and there should be a little pull tab at the top that you can open up. This is actually a chocolate cake. It's a, it's a gato chocolate. Um, and uh, I think it's an originally intended for camping maybe, but uh, I wanted to, to do something a little bit different. And uh, so, you know, we, you open it up and it, it's got a, a chocolate, never seen this chocolate cake in here. Um, and this one, um, to be honest, I, I actually, go ahead and take, take a, a bite of this uh, before we, we try it with the shochu. Um, it's, oh, wow. you know, if it came out while I was camping, I'd be, I'd be really happy. Um, I'm not sure I'd enjoy this at a, like a three-star Michelin star restaurant. It's, uh, I mean, it, it tastes as you kind of imagine like a canned chocolate cake would. However, <laughs> this, is, this is where we're gonna see the beauty of shochu because uh, I think myself, you get a lot of the egg, the, the flour. There's not a lot of cocoa. It's not terrible, but it's not amazing. Now, uh, go ahead and get your rice shochu. Oh, right. Rice, rice, rice. yeah. Yeah. So oh, we have to get you a little bit more there. Um, so if you go in with a sip of the rice shochu with, uh, with the chocolate cake, and Suddenly you get like coffee, nut notes, you get a lot more of the, the cacao. Oh, wow. And so uh, you've, you've taken like essentially like, like probably very cheap uh, cocoa powder that they used to make this and made it something very premium. Um, and I think this really sort of speaks to the power of a, of a good pairing of a good shochu is that you can um, you know, take something ordinary and make it quite extraordinary. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a great example of the the food and the drink elevating each other. It's, it's a totally different experience. Yeah. I mean, it's better. a canned canned chocolate cake, and you know, who was like this is whoever thought this up? Genius, <laughs> I have to say. Wow, that's an impressive form factor right there. And then uh, I think it's shelf stable for a couple of years, so it's you know, halfway for, between uh, cake and brownie. Mm -hmm. Love it. And for a country prone to natural disasters, probably a good thing to have on hand along with a, a few bottles of shochu. Um, it actually goes really well with the coca as well. So, um, and, and mugi, uh, if you go back to the mugi, uh, you've got a lot of sort of toasty notes in there. Um, mugi choco, uh, sure. they're like the little barley, puffed barley with chocolate on the outside. That's the kind of flavor that you end up getting. Uh, for I think for a lot of Japanese uh, people that grew up here, it's uh, sort of a nostalgic Food. Um, oh, it absolutely. Is. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, so if you had to, sorry, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, best food plus shochu experience. I I'll start mm -hmm. because I've got an amazing one. I once had. Um, it was a sweet potato shochu that was what's called hanakare, which means that it is the heads of the distillation of it, and it was the bottle was put in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And then I was out having oysters on the half shell, and we were pouring the sweet potato shochu on top of that, and we slurped the shochu and the oyster in at the same time, and it was magnifique. It was absolutely off the charts. 
Um, and I just, if you could have explained it to me and I would have kind of got it, but then when I actually did that, it was just an absolutely amazing marriage of flavors. And, and I don't know, what's, what's the most interesting, do you have any anything fun to add? Uh, I mean, I have so many experiences that, uh, that, that it's a little bit hard to, 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 to think of one in particular, but I think the most um, mind-blowing one for me was, uh, it was a sweet potato shochu um, it's, it, that had the flavor of oranges. Oh, okay. um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you, you get, uh, I mean, obviously sweet potato is going to taste like sweet potato, a lot of earthy notes, but something that was just so citrusy. I mean, it tasted like I was eating candied oranges. And that to me was like really um, mind expanding in, the, in just in terms of the possibilities within sort of one vertical of, of shochu. It's, it is, it is, it's bonkers. I don't think there's a better way to explain it. And it is still Japan's best kept secret. I mean, one thing, let me give you a couple of details here before we head into our next segment, which is gonna involve cocktails. There is more shochu and aomori produced in Japan than tequila in Mexico. And yet less than 1% shochu leaves the country. Less than, far less than 1%. I think that's because we, we don't want the rest of the yeah, world right? to know. <laughs> Obviously we don't want this secret to get out of the bag, but it is Japan's best kept culinary secret. Yeah. This is, we're very happy to share it with you. You are, you're trailblazers here. You're on the leading edge of this. You get to, help spread the love. Um, this is really not well understood outside of Japan. So welcome to the radical. Next, um, we're going to move on to cocktails. And we have a very interesting presentation set up for you that is going to be led by Mr. Sako. And Mr. Sako is a, an, a registered and credentialed bartender here in Japan. He's the, the, the um, manager the bar manager of the Orient Express at a hotel, a very famous hotel in Itebukuro. He's won a slew of awards, bartending competitions with his own original cocktails. And he is working with us to bring show to, to these new channels. And that means cocktails, because that's what works in a lot of places. That's where people experience spirit for the first time in a lot of places. So we'd like to welcome him into the show now to talk to us about some of the different cocktail possibilities. And uh, we're gonna start, I believe we're gonna receive. Wow, this is cool. We've got our own uh, award-winning bartender here to. Here he is. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow, this is new. This is, this is, you know, my hot stuff. Hot sauce. So we've got a hot tea here. Uh, this is uh, hojicha. Um, so it's a roasted roasted uh, tea uh, rice. Uh, again, again, my it's a roasted rice uh, along with uh, hojicha, which is rice roasted green tea. Um, hot. You've got the packets. You've got the you've got the genmai packets. Unfortunately, we weren't able to find four G packets in the same size form, but. Uh, you can largely make this on your own. And uh, we're going to be able to watch a video about how to make it in just a moment. はい、では今回はお家で作れる麦焼酎を使ったカクテルをご提案させていただきます。まずはこちら。麹玄米茶のこちらを適量4グラムを入れてまいりますこちらが温かいお湯ですね、90ミリこちら決められた量を注いでまいります。え、今回温かいお茶を使ったカクテルを提案させていただいたのはまず器具がとても少ないというところから利点があります。普段ハイボールなどを作る場合でも氷ですとかこういったバーのツールがあった方が美味しいものが作れます。こちらを一切いらない
玄米の香ばしい味わいを重ねていくようなイメージでございますではこちら蒸らした1分ほど蒸らしたものをまずはグラスに注いでいきますゲンマイ茶特有のとても香ばしい香りがしてまいります後から焼酎を注ぐのには焼酎の香りをより強く感じるためという意味合いもございますこちらが麦焼酎のほうじ玄米茶割り、えー、これから寒い季節にぴったりのおうちカクテルでございますお召し上がりくださいはい。Um, and so you get that kind of that double impact of, of that sort of really nice, nutty flavor. Right. And you still have the, the kind of the grainy toastiness of the shochu. Of the shochu as well. as well. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So,、um, you know, Christopher was saying earlier that there are many different ways to enjoy shochu.、Uh, you can, you know, have it on the rocks, you can have it with soda, you can have it with hot water. But another very common way of having it is with tea, like、uh, oolong tea. Or green tea.、Um, and so, this is a, it's a really beautiful way of sort of pairing uh,、um, such a, a, a nutty shochu with,、uh, with, with a nutty tea. This is good. I, yeah, I could drink several of these. The, the glass is an interesting choice. Wine glasses, and it's, it's great in wine glasses, but are there other glasses that you would recommend? Yeah, the color? Yeah. So,、um, Okay, so,、um, so he has two reasons for using a wine glass.、Um, the first one is that you're with a wine glass, it's built to basically hold the, the aroma. So when you bring your nose up to it, You're able to enjoy the aroma of the, the tea and the, the shochu.、Um, the other reason is that so you all are able to see the insides、exactly. um, of what's in the glass. But another way to enjoy it, he was saying, is to use a、uh, oyunomi, which is a,、um, a ceramic、uh, cup、oh, used for, for tea, basically. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Well, this, this is, this is a way, one way to、uh, work with a bottle of shochu. And next, Absolutely, I think so as well. I think we're ready with the next video, so let's, let's jump into the video. はい、次は黒糖焼酎とミントティーを使った冷たいカクテルのご提案をさせていただきます。まずは先ほどのカクテル同様にあったかいミントティーを作ってまいります。え茶葉は4グラム。
今回は緑茶とミントのブレンドティーを使用しますでお湯は90ミリ入れてまいりますでは1分間蒸らしていきますはいこちらが蒸らし終わったあったかいミントティーでございますこちらに溶けやすいうちに蜂蜜を混ぜてまいります冷たい状態ですと混ぜにくいためあらかじめ合わせておきますこちらを2ティースプーンなじませておきますはいこちらが先ほど蜂蜜を合わせて冷やしたミントティーでございますまずはこちらに焼酎をグラスに30ミリ注いでまいります今回この黒糖上地を使わせていただいて分かったことがいろいろとありますやはり砂糖きびから使えた材料だけあって甘いものとの相性はとてもよく感じられましたなのでこちら他にも黒糖を使ったカクテルやそういったものもとても相性がいいと考えますで冷たい飲み物を作るときはしっかりと焼酎を冷やしていきたいと思いますその方が仕上がりでの一体感が生まれますこちらに3倍量入れてまいります。こちら黒糖焼酎のミントティー割りです。もちろんあったかいものでも寝る前のリラックス効果。昼間にでも飲める爽やかな味わいです。どうぞお楽しみください。And it's, it's so simple, but、uh, the flavors all come together. I mean,、uh, I think a lot of it is the subtle sun skill in mixing these, but wow. Hmm. Oh, okay. Now, in, in, one thing that I, I realized is that in the, in the pack that you receive, it's, it's, the, it's only the mint. mint. Yes. Okay. So、um, we're missing. One, one part, the green, green tea portion, yeah, okay, and then honey、mm-hmm. is important. Uh, honey comes out so well, yeah. I don't, I don't, honey, I'm cutting it so much too. I'm just so much. I'm a simple number, I'm a little bit more than 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 a little bit So,、um, Sato san was just telling us, we were, I was asking about、uh, the honey because、uh, really the aroma here, you get a lot of the honey along with the mint、uh, and the shochu. But uh,、um, to make it easy for everybody to be able to, to pick up、um, the ingredients for this,、uh, he used a, just the regular、uh, honey that you can pick up at a supermarket. It's, it's nothing special. But that is one way that you can elaborate on it even more. You know, if you had、uh, like a buckwheat honey versus a clover honey versus a you know, a orange blossom honey, I think you can get very different flavors to come out of it.、Um, but this is this is really delightful. Thank you so much.、Uh, he, he did say he cheated a little bit and used a really nice uh, tea. Uh, it's a green tea mixed with a, with a mint tea. But you know, I think even with the, 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 same, the, the, the <laughs> I think one thing that we can take from this is that a variety of teas work in conjunction with shochu, especially with sweet potato shochu, sweet potato shochu, and some of the, the earthiness of that goes really well with different varieties of tea. It's used all the time, little mohai and, and other expressions of cocktail in, in 
bar culture, the T is a very common. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really well, I mean, it's also, I think, uh, within the, the Japanese culture, it's a very tea oriented culture historically. So, you know, it makes sense that it carries over into the drinking culture as well. But, you know, I think even within the world of tea in Japan, there's so many different types of tea. Within green tea, there's, you know, there's subdivisions. Uh, you know, you have like a hojicha, bancha, genmaicha. Um, so it's it's a it's a fun world to kind of start to mix and match those artisan teas with uh, these artisan um, spirits. To so all of the bartenders and mixologists out there watching right now, there is so much potential for creating something new, original, something that's never been experienced before. Um, Unfortunately, outside of Japan, the, the availability of shows in Aomori is a little bit limited. But there are a lot more business entities involved these days that are bringing a greater variety of product to a larger number of countries. So as soon as you see new stuff, please start working with it. And if you come up with great things, then tag JSS, the Japan Sake and Shoshi Makers Association, and they will absolutely relay, relay that out to everybody who follows. So, uh, we need images here. Pictures are important. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, just, just to kind of go back and touch upon uh, one more time, just the, the, the interest about all of these is that there's just such a wide variety of flavors. You, you got to try you know, just a small uh, sampling today, but we really encourage you to go and try out different shochus. I think a lot of us have a friend you know, that drank a little too much in, in uh, college and you know, felt like uh, they were a little turned off maybe even mistook it for other types of, uh, of spirits, maybe. but um, it is such a broad world. So, you know, if you, um, if you have friends that really love whiskey, uh, like an aged, uh, cast aged uh, shochu might be a good option. Friends that love rum, uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, kokuto shochu. Um, and I think there's, there's, uh, there's something out there for everybody. So, um, you know, if there are some that you really enjoyed today and some that, that maybe not so much, um, you know, th that's kind of a starting point to go and explore that rabbit hole, as well, Christopher that's, said. And that's what I always, and that's what we always say is basically there is a show to you for everyone. Yeah. Or Awamori. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't get drawn to sweet potato show to right from the start, but maybe you're really into aloe show to or maybe you love carrot show to or maybe, I don't uh, know. Milk junior show to you. I don't know. <laughs> You know, there might, there's, a, there's so many different uh, subcategories. So find your style. Then the next step is how do you want to drink it? Um, in Japan, typically, on the rocks is very common. Uh, mixing it with sparkling water in something of a highball is also very common. A slightly more traditional style, as Mark mentioned before, hot water or yuani. 50-50 uh, hot water and show to make sure the water isn't too hot because the alcohol will evaporate if it's too hot. And then also we're talking cocktails, 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 cocktails. And you really have, I mean, the world is your oyster here, literally. There's a lot that has uh, not been done yet. And there's a lot of experimentation that needs to happen. Why 45% of the, the shochu shipments and sales in Japan are sweet potato products. Why is there not a sweet potato cocktail, like a signature named after a hotel sweet potato cocktail? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, somebody's going to crack that code. It's going to happen. It will happen. Uh, maybe it'll be subtle song. Maybe it will. Be <laughs> and there's so many things that these, these pair well with. I mean, just thinking about sweet potatoes, I'm thinking pumpkin. I'm thinking apple pie. I'm thinking yeah. there's so many flavors that work together. Yeah. Tea, right? Yeah. Tea. There's so many possibilities. And, um, you know, with the, the ability to make your own syrups and to, to isolate certain flavors, I think it's only a matter of time. Um, I can't wait to taste it. Yep. Honestly. <laughs> Yeah. So shall we move on to the Q&A? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we've got a lot of questions lined up for us. Stephen, are you, are you there? I am here. And I, I have to say that I'm incredibly jealous that you could enjoy those cocktails. And and I had to sit at home and just imagine what they might be like. But you did have the snacks and the... the, the... I had, I'll, t I'll tell you, the the uh, the, <laughs> the camping chocolate cake with the rice shochu was pretty 
pretty fantastic. That was that was a surprise. It's interesting, right? You take that first bite without anything, and it tastes like yeah. you'd expect, and then it sort of changes a little bit. Yeah, almost almost makes me want to go camping. And, <laughs> but uh, no, this it was great. Uh, you guys, I thought did a wonderful job. You really, the, the pairings were spot on. The cocktails sound great. And uh, yeah, why don't we get to some some questions? I think, uh, let me see, just uh, we had quite a few come through while it was um, going on. We had a couple early questions actually about my presentation that we didn't get to. Uh, one was whether or not uh, you can use something other than rice to to cultivate the koji, to, to inoculate with koji. And of course, any any grain or any any substrate with complex carbohydrates or with starches conceivably could be used uh, for koji propagation. Rice is obviously the most common because it's also the most plentiful uh, grain crop available in Japan, but there is barley koji. There is, uh, obviously you can use the short grain rice or long grain rice. There's actually been koji inoculated on sweet potato, right? For hundred percent sweet potato shochu. And then uh, there is soba koji as well. And then of course, koji can grow on just about anything. So. That was uh, kind of a, you know, pretty good question though. I think it's, we typically associate uh, koji with uh, rice, but for example, there are barley koji misos, right? There's barley miso, which is where you've grown the, the koji on barley rather than on rice. Um, <clears throat> another question, maybe uh, Christopher, you can speak to this, is whether or not in, in Nihonshu and in sake, there are sake rices, there are very, there are a premium sake rice used for sake production. What what happens in shochu? Is it is it premium rice or is it uh, something else? What's what's used? That's a that's a very good question. There's a wide variety of uh, experiences that can respond to that. Basically, everything from Yamada Nishiki being used to mm -hmm. make shochu all the way to um, you know sometimes people use the same rice that's used to make most like awamori, which is Thai, thai rice, rice from Thailand. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. and everything in between. Uh, Steve, what, what have you seen in terms of your own experiences working at Yamato Kozakura as a, as a um, distillery hand? What, yeah. what so is it exactly? The, the rice is really used as a, as a substrate for the koji propagation. And you do get some expression of the rice. But for example, how Yamato Zakura will differentiate their rice is they're going to use uh, locally grown shinmai or new rice. So it's not stored grains. It's, it's actually fresh rice. Uh, and that shochu, which is uh, called uh, hikari, actually expresses uh, a lot of the rice, uh, even though it's a sweet potato uh, shochu. Uh, and that's actually, it's called hikari because of the koshi hikari rice that's used in the, in the process. And, and so it is a sake rice. Um, now, typically, it's food grade rice that's used in a lot of shochu production, wow. but especially in Kumamoto, you'll get a lot of premium rice is used because that's the home of rice shochu. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's actually uh, super interesting because for sake production, in order to maximize the output, it's not so much a premium rice, but it's rice that's made specifically for fermentation. And the difference is, is that the rice kernel is much larger. It's almost uh, like a Yamada Nishiki. It can be almost like twice the size of, uh, of some of the um, you know, more like eating types of rice. And what you get with that is, is with sake, you always polish down the outside. And so, you know, if you start with, uh, you know, rice for cooking, you end up with like a grain of sand at the end. Uh, but these, um, these uh, ones made specifically for sake and fermentation, they're quite large. And the center grain, you can actually see a little bit of white core. It's called the shimpaku, the white uh, uh, the center uh, that had a lot of uh, um, starch. Uh, you mm -hmm. want the starch for the fermentation without the protein. That's right. You're getting a lot of the starch from the other ingredient. Once you go into the secondary, the second fermentation, the main fermentation, you're getting the starch from the sweet potato from the barley uh, in order to, to goose up the, the yield. Uh, so I think it's less, less important in shochu. Although you do see premium rice used, you, but what you typically don't see is high polishing rates. You usually yeah. see food grade polishing rates of 80 or 90 percent of the grain remaining. Uh, and again, that's going to maximize yield. And the reason it doesn't matter so much in shochu as it does for sake is because of distillation. Yeah. You're going to remove a lot of the, the flavor of the protein and that sort of thing that would be residual in a higher, uh, less polished rice as you would for a sake. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Mark, um, about some of the reasons and, and why they're using those, those, those rices in premium sake. Another question actually came up about the rice in the context of the, of the kokuto shochu because it actually says it's made with Thai mai. It's made with Thai rice, so long grain rice. Now, and the reason is 
are there any regulations about the use of foreign rice? And there absolutely is not. Uh, and there are two reasons why you would, you would use Taimai, right? I think one is cost. It's, it's a pretty affordable uh, 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 ingredient to use for, for shochu production. But cost is not the only consideration, of course. The Taimai has richer flavors. So there's a preference for awamori made from Thai rice because of the sort of the unctuous, fatty, oily uh, expressions that you get from something like the Yuki Ocho. Christopher and I were in Okinawa uh, together, fortunately, earlier this year, and we were able to try awamori made from Japanese domestic rice. And it was a completely different animal. It's completely wow. different. Yep. <laughs> and there's very little of it made, but it's, it, it's his own drink. It's delicious. It's still 100% koji, black koji. Uh, really beautiful drink in its own right, but it didn't taste like what we expect from awamori, which is much more that rich, deep, uh, full-bodied expression. And so when you want to goose up your your body in in your kokuto shochu or your sweet potato shochu or or another shochu, you might use taimai over Japanese rice because it expresses more, it gives you more, more body to the drink. So, cool. Um, so one question is, uh, which of these shochu is the most sweet? Well, I think it, it depends on what you mean by sweet. If by sweet you mean uh, what has the most sugar, um, it would be none of the above because uh -huh. there, are, there are no residual sugars in these. Um, but sweet in terms of fragrance, yep. um, I don't know, Christopher, what do you think? Sometimes, sometimes the, the presence of the alcohol tricks you into feeling like it's, it's the ethanol times something else tricks you into feeling like it's sweet. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on how sublimated the, the ethanol is in many cases. For me, at least on the nose and at least on the attack, the cocktail sugar show through tends to present very quickly as a little bit sweet, but then it dries out it does. Started as a Sahara by the end. <laughs> right? and, and that's how show to rolls basically. It, it can on the nose it can be sweet. At the beginning it can be a little bit sweet, but then at by the end you're like, oh yeah. That wasn't sweet. Yeah. <laughs> But, but that's a good thing, right? Yeah, um, no, you don't I, want it to be cloying or, or to, to remain. But yeah, and it really comes down to the fragrance, like what you're, what you're sensing in your, um, in your olfactory senses. So fruit, fruity notes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Beni Komaki and then yeah. the Mai yeah. Sengeku had the, the, that fruity aroma. That's right. I, th I think the correct answer, is, which is the sweetest, was actually the, uh, the mint tea cocktail. <laughs> honey. With the honey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Trick question. Yeah, another great question uh, is how did the sweet potato get from South America to Okinawa? And as, as best we know, it was actually Portuguese traders going from South America to China, the Chinese trading with the Okinawans and the Okinawans trading with the Japanese. We believe that that's the route by which the sweet potato made it all the way to, to Satsuma, to Kagoshima in southern yeah. Japan. It brought, brought north by a guy who's remembered by the name of his job. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Nobuni Solka, right? <clears throat> oh, that's right. I don't even know his name. Only job, but... Yeah, let's see. Okay, so there was actually a question that came up about the, the fondue, Christopher. Can you explain that? I think maybe we might have misunderstood that. That was a fondue, a shochu pairing with fondue. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The fondue did not have shochu in it. Not that I was aware of. No, okay, it's not but fondue. I'm sure it's possible. But, but that is not only possible. I think like, because you often add a little bit of kirsch or some beer. Um, so it could be very interesting. Sure, you can do a white wine fondue. There's all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially like because there's no acidity in any of these, um, it would be, uh, it could be very nice, especially with uh, you know something that's got a little bit of fruitiness, a little creaminess, like like the rice shochu could be a way to cut some of that richness in the cheese. Absolutely. And I'm going to quote Mark here, um, one of my favorite quotes from many years ago when we did a, a different JSS event. Um, you very rarely have a bad shochu pair, and that's absolutely the case. The reason being is because, as you just said, there is really no acidity to speak of in most of most shochu, so you don't get no uh, tannins. There's uh, no class acidities. You, there's very little little risk yeah. of a of a faulty yeah. pairing. Like you wouldn't want to pair uh, red wine with like oysters or caviar or something like that uh, because you know the tannins and the acidity is really going to just um, kind of curdle in your mouth and make a really kind of awful awful taste, but you definitely won't have that with any of these. There's obviously pairings that will make, you know, one plus one equals five, um, like we saw with the, the chocolate cake, 
Um, but even if you make a mistake, it's still going to taste okay. Great. No, that's that's a great great way to to think about it. So just a couple more questions. Um, we're gonna there are some questions about cocktails, but I thought maybe we'd hold those a little bit toward the end so that we can okay. uh, get those all at once. But one question is uh, if if champagne is the most prestigious version of sparkling wine, what is the champagne of shochu? Uh, what is what is the most what would we consider the most premium category within the shochu world? And I, in my mind, I go in two directions. I'll just I've had more time to think about the question than than, than you guys. So. I'll, I, I think you have the four WTO designations, which is the reason the champagne is champagne is because it's made in Champagne, France, right? Just sparkling wine made can only be called champagne if it's made in Champagne, France. Um, so you have the four WTO designations for shochu, which is the Iki shochu, the Kuma shochu from Kumamoto, the rice shochu, you have the Satsuma shochu super data from Kagoshima, and you have a Yukyu Awamori. So which of those is the most prestigious Depends on where you are, yeah. right? In Okinawa, clearly, kusu awamori, long-aged awamori, it is dearly expensive. You will get a 40 or $50 pour in a bar. Yeah. So that is as extreme, but that's long age. When we sell long age, we're talking about, it's got nothing on, like whiskey's got nothing on this stuff. This is 30, 40, 50 years old uh, awamori, Asian ceramic, and it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful drink, but it is extremely expensive. Uh, and then I would think that you get to Satsuma with some handmade sweet potato shochu is probably another area where you've got a very premium product, especially again if it's got some age on it. Um, but there are really small distilleries with very limited production. So, absolutely. Um, yep. yeah, we've seen a lot of thousand dollar bottles of sweet potato popping up all over the place. Sure, sure. Yeah, what would we just see a 50 year old kokuto shochu? Well, that, yeah, that, okay, great. Oh, great. That, well, that, so yeah, that one Mashu made by Musuhira Shizo down in um, Amami, and they're, they're, they put out a limited thousand dollar bottle recently. So, yeah, it's uh, it's all over. Did that sell out? Uh, they they are they reserved enough of it to send overseas that it's going to be available, so it's not completely gone. But I think the domestic availability is, um, is uh, we like, missed out. It's all <laughs> All right, so why don't we move toward the cocktail questions? Um, so one question is the cocktails sounded great, but what is the, um, how would, what kind of garnish would you use in the glass for these cocktails to make them more, like give them more curb appeal, that they would it'd be more appealing as you're serving them to the customer? Would, would you recommend any garnishes for either of the two cocktails that were presented today? はい。はい。So um uh to summarize uh basically there's a lot of different ways that uh you can you can garnish a cocktail um obviously there's the visual appeal uh but there's also the fragrance so you know like uh um if you were to, to mix shochu with uh, soda water uh, uh you could use something like rosemary uh, but you don't want something that's going to overpower the shochu uh so that's something to be careful of i think you know maybe something with a, like a lighter flavor like the rice shochu uh, if you start adding things like rosemary or herb, it might be a little bit too powerful, and that's that's kind of all you get. Or that might be what you want to go for. So um, uh, I guess it's not quite an answer, but it, it depends. Okay, yeah. And uh, then another question I think is kind of riffs on this a little bit is um, if, if uh, we usually drink gin and tonic at home, then uh, which of these shochu would, would go well with tonic? うん、ジンとミックを入れ飲んでる方は、あの、何がいい一番、あの、焼酎の中で何が一番おすすめ。芋焼酎。はい。が絶対に。芋焼酎もそれ一番いい。少しグレートリコがいいと思います。あの、と
、あそこに香りも、健康学も持ってるんで、その器に入れてくれたあの色によっても、ワイトキャップには入らなくて、それで、繊維的な、量の量の気持ちの大きいのは、ワイトキャップに入ただ、ライムを入れたりとかっていうと、ちょっと壊れる印象もあるので、柑橘の選定っていうのは、すごく気をつけた方がいい。グレープフルーツとか。グレープフルーツとか、あの、国産のビズタリの皮とかにはすごい。はい。So,、um, so his、um, Sato san's recommendation is、uh, sweet potato shochu,、um, but it depends on the type of sweet potato.、Um, so, things that are like、um, a sort of more floral or more sweet、uh, might work a little better in place of gin with, with the tonic water.、Um, the one place that he has a, a little bit of caution is、uh, adding lime. Lime has a very strong flavor.、Uh, so, you know, possibly using、uh, something more like grapefruit, something a little bit sweeter. Or、uh, even from yuzu. So, you know, in the grocery stores, especially in winter, you see these、uh, yellow fruit. They look like small、uh, mandarins, but it, it's a yuzu.、Uh, and you can just take a little bit of that peel、uh, to get the, the aromas from there and,、uh, and add it into your、uh, shochu tonic. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great call. I think the, and the, the follow up question was actually what shochu goes best with lemon or lime? And I would follow on the yuzu comment. That in Oita, which is where 100% barley shochu is most often made, kabosu is their local citrus. And it's similar to yuzu, it's a little bit、uh, more mild. And kabosu with soda and mugi shochu is just beautiful and barley shochu. So that's, a, that's another direction you can go. But I agree that lemon might just be really, you know, a little bit too, too strong for, for some of the shochu given the lower alcohol percent. So we're actually right up against、uh, the top of the hour. I think we want to just have some closing remarks.、Uh, so that concludes our. Q&A, but、uh, thank you all very much for listening. And、uh, who's doing the closing? Is that you, Christopher? I Looks like you. Yeah, probably me. Put it on your phone on set.、Yeah, thank you. Thank you for managing the chat. I think this is pretty good、uh, teamwork throughout this entire thing. Hopefully, you were, you were, you found out a whole bunch of new things. Hopefully, you enjoyed all of the tasting that you did, or at least, at least some of them, and you know which way you need to explore more. And that was the goal of this entire thing, basically, was to show you all of the versatility of these drinks, to show you that even in their most traditional sense, when you drink them neat, they're very, very interesting. And that when you try them with food, they can become even more interesting. And that when you open them up to the possibilities of, of the cocktail world, the, the possibilities really are endless. And so, in that sense, Thank you for joining us on the beginning of this international journey of Japan's best kept secret.、Um, with your help, and please do tell your friends, this is going to be big. And we are very excited, as you can tell, to share this with all of you with the help of the Japan Sake and Shochu, Sake and Shochu Makers Association, and with all of the people that are helping us to make this possible、um, from all of us here in Tokyo and in Fukuoka. And elsewhere in Japan,、um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your taste buds. And,、um, <laughs> and, and don't forget to fill out the questionnaire. That's right. <laughs> the questionnaire at the end, very, very important. Also, the cocktail recipes today will be available on YouTube just so that you can try them out. You can riff on them in your own time. They'll be available from the J- Japan Shoju official. YouTube channel, Japan Shows You Official. So check those out if you need a,、um, a little bit of a refresher. And let us know what you think.、Um, definitely tag the Japan Sake and Shows You Makers Association with any recipes that you come up with with a photo. Photos are very important. Hit us up on Instagram and、uh, let's share. Let's share. Let's discover. And let's keep smiling. One final kanpai、uh, to all of you out there from all of us here. Uh, again, from everyone here in Japan to all of you out there around the world, a very hearty and heartfelt. Kanpai. Kanpai. Kanpai.